Christianity is the wellspring of our nation's values, laws, and civil government. Understanding our role as Christians and as citizens is essential if America is to be restored as a nation under God. They've taken him out of our public schools, They've taken him out of our textbooks. We have, since the time of our founding fathers, forgotten our heritage very badly. In less than 175 years, we went from courts that dared not violate the laws of God to those that mock it. Now what we've uh, really gone to is a government uh, that has abandoned, in many senses, the written Constitution. We're seeing that happen more and more in our nation. You turn away from the laws of God, and you've got chaos. We are trying to do a futile thing if we do not know where we came from or what we have been about. Don't give up on America. We must understand our heritage. There's a real need for us to restore the nation under God. For the God of heaven is the third party that is always involved in every event. And he has been involved in the event of the founding of this nation, this freest nation that the world has ever known. With God's grace and mercy, we could reclaim what we've lost, we could protect what we have, and we could shape who we become. And together with God's grace, we will win. When Benjamin Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention, he was asked by a woman, Sir, what have you given us? His immediate response was, A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Yet most Americans today have been persuaded that our nation's governmental system is a democracy and not a republic. The difference between these two is essential in understanding Americanism and the American system. Before we discuss political systems, however, it's helpful to address the confusion that has been spread about the political spectrum. Many have been led to believe that the political spectrum places groups such as communists on the far left, fascists or dictators on the far right, and political moderates or centrists in the middle. However, a more accurate political spectrum will show government having zero power on the far right to having 100% power on the far left. At the extreme right, there is no government. The extreme left features total government under such labels as communism, socialism, Nazism, fascism, princes, potentates, dictators, kings, any form of total government. Those who claim that Nazis and fascists are right-wing never define their terms. This amounts to spreading confusion. Toward the middle of the political spectrum can be found the type of government limited to its proper role of protecting the rights of the people. That's where the Constitution of the United States is. Those who advocate such a form of government are really constitutional moderates. So let's analyze the basic forms of government. They are monarchy or dictatorship ruled by one, oligarchy ruled by a few, democracy ruled by a majority, republic ruled by law, and anarchy which is ruled by no one. In discussing these five, we'll see that they can be narrowed down to even fewer. Looking first at monarchy or dictatorship, this form of government doesn't really exist in the practical sense. It's always a group that puts one of its members up front. A king has his council of nobles or earls, and every dictator has his bureaucrats or commissars, the men behind the scenes. This isn't ruled by one, even though one person may be the visible leader. It's ruled by a group. So let's eliminate monarchy, dictatorship, because it never truly exists. Oligarchy, which is ruled by a group, is the most common form of government in all history. And it is the most common form of government today. Most of the nations of the world are ruled by a powerful few. And therefore, oligarchy remains. At the other end, we find anarchy, which means without government. Some people have looked over history and found that many of its worst crimes were committed by governments. So they decided that having no government might be a good idea. But this is a mistake, because as the ancient Greeks stated, without law there can be no freedom. Our founding fathers agreed and held that some amount of government is a necessary force in any civilized orderly society.
In a state of anarchy, however, everyone has to guard life, liberty and property and the lives of family members. Everyone must be armed and movement is severely restricted because one's property has to be protected at all times. Civilized people have always hired someone to do the guarding, a sheriff, a police force, or some branch of government. Once law enforcement was in place, the people were freer. They could leave their property, work in the fields, and so on. In short, the proper amount of government makes everyone freer. There are some who advocate anarchy, however, not because they want no government, but because they don't like what they have. They use anarchy as a tool for revolutionary change. The condition of anarchy is very much like a vacuum where something rushes in to fill it. These calculating anarchists work to break down the existing government with rioting, killing, looting and terrorism. Tragically, the people living in such chaos often go to those best able to put an end to it and beg them to take over and restore order. And who is best able to put an end to the chaos? The very people who started it. The anarchists who created the problem then create a government run by them, an oligarchy, where they have total power. This is exactly what happened in Russia that led to Lenin taking total power, and in Germany where Hitler's brown shirts created the chaos that brought him to power. But anarchy isn't a stable form of government. It's a quick transition from something that exists to something desired by the power hungry. It's a temporary condition. And because it isn't permanent, we eliminate it as well. The word democracy comes from two Greek words, demos, meaning people, and kratian, meaning to rule. Democracy, therefore, means the rule of the people, majority rule. This, of course, sounds good, but suppose the majority decides to take away one's home, or business, or children. Obviously, there has to be a limit. The flaw in democracy is that the majority isn't restrained. If more than half the people can be persuaded to want something in a democracy, they rule. What about republic? Well, that comes from the Latin. Res meaning thing, and publica meaning public. It means the public thing, the law. A true republic is one where the government is limited by law, leaving the people alone. America's founders had a clean slate to write on. They could have set up an oligarchy. In fact, there were some who wanted George Washington to be their king. But the Founding Fathers knew history, and they chose to give us the rule of law in a republic, not the rule of a majority in a democracy. Why? Let's demonstrate the difference in the setting of the Old West. Consider a lynch mob in a democracy. Thirty-five horseback riders chase one lone gunman. They catch him, and they vote 35 to 1 to hang him. Democracy has triumphed, and there's one less gunman to contend with. Now consider the same scenario in a republic. The 35 horseback riders catch the gunman and vote 35 to 1 to hang him. But the sheriff arrives, and he says, you can't kill him. He's got his right to a fair trial. So they take the gunman back to town. A jury of his peers is selected, and they hear the evidence and the defense, and they decide if he shall hang. Does the jury even decide by majority rule? No, it has to be unanimous or he goes free. The rights of the government aren't subject to majority rule but to the law. This is the essence of a republic. Many Americans would be surprised to learn that the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution. Nor does it appear in any of the constitutions of the 50 states. The founders did everything they could to keep us from having a democracy. James Madison, rightly known as the father of the Constitution, wrote in essay number 10 of the Federalist Papers, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Alexander Hamilton agreed, and he stated, we are a republican government. Real liberty is never found in despotism or in the extremes of democracy. Samuel Adams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, stated, Democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. The founders had good reason to look upon democracy with contempt because they knew that the democracies in the early Greek city-states produced some of the wildest excesses of government imaginable. 
In every case, they ended up with mob rule, then anarchy, and finally tyranny under an oligarchy. During that period in Greece, there was a man named Solon, who urged creation of a fixed body of law not subject to majority whims. But where the Greeks never adopted Solon's wise counsel, the Romans did. Based on what they knew of Solon's laws, they created the Twelve Tables of the Roman Law and in effect built a republic that limited government power and left the people alone. Since government was limited, the people were free to produce with the understanding that they could keep the fruits of their labor. In time, Rome became wealthy and the envy of the world. In the midst of plenty, however, the Roman people forgot what freedom entailed. They forgot that the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. When government power grows, people freedom recedes. Once the Romans dropped their guard, power-seeking politicians began to exceed the powers granted them in the Roman Constitution. Some learned that they could elect politicians who would use government power to take property from some and give it to others. Agriculture subsidies were introduced, followed by housing and welfare programs. Inevitably, taxes rose and controls over the private sector were imposed. Soon, a number of Rome's producers could no longer make ends meet, and they went on the dole. Productivity declined, shortages developed, and mobs began roaming the streets, demanding bread and circuses from the government. Many were induced to trade freedom for security. Eventually, the whole system came crashing down. They went from a republic to a democracy and ended up with an oligarchy under a progression of the Caesars. Thus, democracy itself is not a stable form of government. Instead, it is the gradual transition from limited government to the unlimited rule of an oligarchy. Knowing this, we as Americans are ultimately left with only two choices. We can keep our republic, as Franklin put it, or we will inevitably end up with an oligarchy, a tyranny of the elite. Election day is upon us, and for voters of faith, there's some things worth remembering. The first comes from Proverbs 14.34, which reminds us that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. This verse affirms what is also proven by history. It is not economics that exalts a nation, it's issues of righteousness. Yet today, nearly half of believers say that when it comes time to vote, economic issues are more important to them than moral issues. There is simply no biblical support for that position. In fact, recall Matthew 6. The disciples were worried about economic things, about where to get their clothing and shelter and food, and Jesus told them, cool it. He said, watch the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, and notice how well God provides for them. He then told his disciples that if they would seek righteousness first, then all the other stuff would be added to them. Economic prosperity is actually a fruit of righteousness. So ironically, when folks seek economics and prosperity first, they usually lose not only economic prosperity, but also national righteousness. But when they seek righteousness first, they nearly always get righteousness and economic prosperity. We're to seek righteousness first, and dozens of Bible passages affirm that a nation's righteousness is determined by its public policies, by how well those policies conform to God's standards. We love to sing, God bless America, but if we really want God to bless America, we've got to give them something to work with. So how do we get public policies in place that God can bless? Proverbs 29.2 answers that question, telling us, When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. The only way to have righteous public policies is to elect the righteous to office. The righteous aren't going to make bad policies, and the wicked aren't going to make good ones. And the righteous won't get into office unless we vote for them. For in America, neither the righteous nor the wicked rule without our approval. We're the ones who choose them, whether good or bad. This principle was well articulated over a century ago by James A. Garfield, our 20th president. By the way, President Garfield was also a minister of the gospel in the Second Great Awakening. Well, in 1876, Garfield correctly noted, Now, more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. 
if it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it's because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. He's right. And from this truth comes the reality that values expressed in Congress in any given session are never really a good reflection of the values of the nation. Rather, they're only a good reflection of the values of those who voted in the last election. This is why Congress often seems so out of step with the rest of the country. Any given Congress will reflect the values of those who voted in the last election, not necessarily that of the whole country. Returning to President Garfield and looking ahead to where we are right now in this generation, he forewarned us, if the next centennial, which is where we are right now, if the next centennial does not find us a great nation, it will be because those who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation do not aid in controlling the political forces. Nobody better represents the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of America than does the church. And we're the ones who have to aid in controlling the political forces. Gratefully, millions of citizens have been praying for this election, and that's invaluable. But there's also much more that we need to do. As Founding Father John Hancock reminded us two centuries ago, I urge you, by all that is dear, by all that is honorable, by all that is sacred, not only that you pray, but also that you act. Indeed. We've prayed for this election, and we'll continue to pray, but we must also act. We must make sure that at the very least we vote. And by the way, for Christians, voting is not a right. It's a duty. It's a stewardship that we owe to God, and it's a stewardship for which we'll answer directly to Him. One day we'll stand before Him and He'll say, What did you do with that vote I gave you? And we'll have to answer. God's people must adopt the political position set forth a century and a half ago by the Reverend Frederick Douglass, the famous African-American who was a civil rights leader before, during, and after the Civil War. Douglass explained to voters in his day, I have one great political idea. The best expression of it I have found in the Bible. It is, righteousness exalted the nation, sin is a reproach to any people. This constitutes my politics, the negative and positive of my politics, and the whole of my politics. We must adopt the very same position. Righteousness must be the issue. It must be the measurement to define what we're for politically and what we're against. And each of us will answer to God not only for whether we voted, but also for how we voted, for what issues drove our vote. If we stand before God and He says, why did you vote for a leader who's attempting to redefine my institution of marriage and who kills the unborn children that I knew before they were in the womb? If he asks us that, and our answer is, because that leader was good on jobs and the economy, he's not going to accept that. We will answer to God for our vote and our involvement, but there are others to whom we'll also answer. As correctly pointed out by the Reverend Matthias Burnett back in 1803, to God and posterity, you're accountable for your rights and your rulers. Let not your children have reason to curse you for giving up those rights and prostrating those institutions which your fathers delivered to you. Wow! But we are the stewards of the nation, and we will answer to God and to our children for what happens on our watch. We, as God's people, are the ones who will decide whether or not this nation will continue to be blessed. As the Reverend Charles Finney, a leader in America's Second Great Awakening reminded the Christians in his day, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. Christians have been exceedingly guilty in this matter, but the time has come when they must act differently. God cannot sustain this free and blessed country, which we love and pray for, unless the church will take right ground. God will bless or curse this nation according to the course Christians take in politics. Indeed. What say let's give God the chance to bless America this year by taking right ground in regard to politics? And then let's continue to take right ground year after year, election after election. It's time to understand that an election is not an event. It's not just a short-term point in time. Rather, an election is an ongoing step in a lifelong process, and we must be involved in that process for the duration. We've been commanded by the Lord in Luke 19, 13 to occupy until He comes, no matter how long it takes. Let's make sure that we do just that, so that when the Lord comes and when He examines our stewardship of the civic realm, He can say to us, 
Well done, good and faithful servant. So as we close in on the election, let's continue to pray for this election. And by the way, an excellent voting prayer for this election is found in Isaiah 5:26, which declares that God whistles for those at the end of the earth. And here they come, swiftly and speedily. So let's pray in this election that God will whistle, that his people will hear, that they will come running to the polls, and that when they get to the polls, they'll remember to vote righteousness first. So we'll continue to pray, just as the Lord directed us in 1 Timothy 2. But let's also make sure that we do much more. Let's make sure that we vote, that we educate others around us as to where Canada stand on issues of righteousness, and that we take as many as we can to the polls with us. And by the way, if you're not sure where Canada stand on issues of righteousness, go to www.judeochristianvoterguide.com where you can get a voter's guide for the races in your state. Happy election and God bless. This is a copy of what the first Bible printed in English in America looked like. This Bible was printed by the U.S. Congress in 1782. In the records, it says that this Bible was, quote, a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of our schools, end quote. So the first Bible printed in America in English was printed by Congress for the use of our schools. It's worse than that. In the front of the cover, it says that Congress resolved the United States and Congress assembled recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. So the first Bible printed in English in America was done by the guys who signed the documents, endorsed by Congress, and done for the use of schools. And we're going to be told that they don't want any kind of religion and education. They don't want voluntary prayer. No, it doesn't make sense. This document by itself is fairly significant. But in 1830, Congress commissioned these four paintings over here to recapture what the official record said was the Christian history of the United States. So in these four paintings you have really a span of several hundred years. If I take you through them chronologically, the first is back there, Columbus, landing in the Western world in 1492. Uh, they got out, they knelt down, they had a prayer service. You see the cross they have. They named the land where they had landed San Salvador, meaning Holy Savior, which tells you something of the thinking that was going on then. You come back over my shoulder here, this is the baptism of Pocahontas in Jamestown, and this was in 1613. Uh, over here, the fourth painting is 1620. This is the embarkation of the pilgrims coming to America. You see them gathered around the Bible there. You see the prayer meeting they're having. Now, if you just take those four paintings right there, those four paintings in this great secular hall of government, those four paintings represent two prayer meetings, a Bible study, and a baptism, which is not bad for a secular building. As a matter of fact, you're standing in what in 1857 was the largest church in the United States, is the U.S. Capitol. Back on December the 4th of 1800, uh, members of Congress, members of the Senate, Thomas Jefferson was over the Senate, you had John Trumbull over the House. They decided that on Sundays we would turn, turn the Capitol building into a church building. And starting on Sunday, we started having services in the Capitol. Now, six weeks after that, Thomas Jefferson became President of the United States. But for his eight years as president, he went to church here at the U.S. Capitol, listened to the sermons here at the Capitol, and being commander-in-chief, he decided he could help the worship here at the Capitol. He ordered the Marine Corps Band to come play the worship services at the Capitol. Now, that'd be kind of cool having the Marine Corps Band as your worship band, you know, in church. That church went for the better part of a century, and by 1857, there were 2,000 people a week that went to church in the Hall of the House of Representatives. In addition to that, there were four other churches that met at the Capitol. First Congregational, was this was their church home, as was First Presbyterian, as was Capitol Hill Presbyterian. Churches met here. There was nothing secular or seen to be secular about this building until the last 30, 40, 50 years. I'm revived. Yes. I feel different. Yes. I feel that I'll go home and know how to pray. Last night we walked around the Capitol. 
I spent more time crying and weeping listening to Brother David yes. as he spoke about our government yes. and, and the documents that he held up. And I said, Lord, I said, well, how can I be used? The David Barton tour of the Capitol, that was awesome. It was, it was enlightening. It was awesome. There was so much that I didn't know. It opened up our eyes where the media will only give you one side, but we got to see what America was built on. And even though we knew it, we got to see in depth. And just the information that he gave us, just it blew my mind. Though I've lived in the general area for over 20 years now, I'd never been inside the Capitol before. I'm within two and a half hours of the Capitol. And, uh, and uh, David, the leader, was just phenomenal. So One of the highlights for me was going going to the Capitol building and getting some history about what's been going on uh, as far as how this nation was started. And, and we've been lied to, and that's the, the honest to God truth. And just not and knowing that, has really I'm a little angry about it, and, uh, and I'm at a point of, of getting the education that I need. You see the statue to the left of the door over there, that white marble statue? That is President James A. Garfield. President Garfield uh, was one of the young major generals in the Civil War. Uh, he was a war hero. He became Speaker of the House. He became the 20th President of the United States. And by the way, uh, that man founded Howard University. Uh, General O.O. Howard took it over after he founded it. Just a really cool guy. But what we never hear about that President of the United States is that he was a minister during the Second Great Awakening. Uh, this is actually one of his letters, signed James A. Garfield, 1858. In this letter, President Garfield recounts that he had just finished preaching a revival service where that he preached the gospel 19 times in the revival. He says as a result of his preaching, he said that 34 folks came to Christ and he baptized 31 of them. Now that doesn't seem like a typical presidential activity today. That's what we used to do with presidents in the past. Again, you'd walk through, you'd see that statue, you'd think, oh, there's a president. You'd never think there's a minister. We've so compartmentalized Christianity in such a small box that we don't realize our military leaders, our, our ministers, our educators, our, our, our presidents used to be ministers. That's why I say about one-fourth of these statues are ministers of the gospel. Uh, the church has been silent. It's been a real eye-opener to see uh, you know, the forefathers of our faith in this country, how they engaged the culture, they had a positive impact on the culture, and really we're all the beneficiaries of that generations later. Now, if you come back to these guys right here, these 56 guys right here are the ones that create all the problem with religious expression public today. You see, every time we go into a public setting or a court case, and What's happened is we've all been trained to recognize the two least religious founding fathers. We can all find Jefferson and Franklin, and everybody else was just like them. Really? I mean, most people have no clue that Jefferson started church in the U.S. Capitol that it went for a century. Most people have, have no clue that Thomas Jefferson in 1803 negotiated a treaty with the Kaskasi Indians in which Jefferson put federal funds to pay for missionaries to go evangelize the Indians and gave federal funds so that after they were converted, we'd build them churches in which to worship. And that's our least religious founding father, okay, which tells you something about the others. Out of the 56 guys who signed the Declaration, you have 29 who held seminary or Bible school degrees. My first visit to FRC uh, was that of going through the Capitol tour with David Barton. And that changed my life because in that tour, we learned and found out things about this nation and the founding of this nation that are holy and strictly Christian from the Bible. And you need to know that, you need to hear about that. So I encourage you, make FRC a destination the Family Research Council has given us pastors a voice that goes way beyond our pulpits. There comes a time in every Christian's life when after repeated awakenings, the Holy Spirit says, sleep on, I'll get somebody else. The sexual anarchists have come in and they want to redefine everything for us. So that what was once considered deviant is now supposed to be considered normal. There comes a time in the life of every church when after repeated awakenings, the Spirit of God says, 
Sleep on and I'll find somebody else. Hate crimes, which will criminalize Christianity and throw you and your grandmother and your pastor in jail for spreading the gospel, will become law unless we do something. That the problem with America is not Hillary. The problem with America is not politics. The problem with America is that the biblical Christians who call themselves evangelicals do not study the word of God, do not know the word of God, and do not train their children in the word of God. And make no mistake, there comes a time in the life of every nation when God the Holy Spirit says, sleep on. This doesn't have to happen on our watch. That it is the Word of God and then the Spirit of God that works through His Word that transforms the lives, that then transforms nations. Has God said, sleep on? Not yet. The reason I know that is, we're here. But we need to realize the seriousness of the hour. And we must no longer take Jesus for granted. Times, my friends, are changing. We have to ask God to get us back and see the cause to which we've been called. You see, our founders didn't trust themselves. They understood who they were. They understood the sin sinful nature of man. They understood if they did not create a constitutional government, one bound by covenant, to rule according to the rule of law, then they would fail. When government doesn't protect those liberties, then we've got to change it. We've got to challenge it. We've got to be able to be willing, as they did, to pick up the pen like they picked up the muskets, to pick up the microphone like they picked up those cannon fodder. You can't go to war, Jesus said, unless you've prepared. You see, God reveals truth. Man cannot, unaided by God's revelation, discover the truth. Brothers and sisters, isn't there a nation and even a world that needs to be reclaimed for Jesus Christ? What we've got to do is keep our eyes on Christ. If you want to walk on water, you want to see him pull us out of this mess, guess what? We have the God of the universe, but there's some things we need to do. Do we get it? It's we and our character and our love for Jesus Christ and our knowledge of the Word of God that can bring our nation back. The people are waiting. We must never lose the revolutionary mind. And if we do, we've lost America. This is the word of God. This is what is true. Circumstances, it's not true. The, 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 all of our, our feelings and emotions, they don't matter. This is what matters. I know who wrote the last chapter of the book. And I believe in this generation, there is a movement that's taking place. And in this generation, life will be restored. And in this generation, religious liberty will really be religious liberty. And all it takes is for God's people to pray and to let their faith be turned into action. Watch God work. Hi, I'm David Barton with Wall Builders. Psalms 11.3 reminds us, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In America, more than any other nation except Israel, our foundations have been biblical. In fact, our founding fathers said that they copied the Declaration of Independence from this book, The Two Treatises of Government, which cites the scripture over 1,500 times to show the operation of government. Our foundations are under attack today, and we can't let them be destroyed on our watch. Your pastor is one of many courageous leaders trying to hold back the moral decay, but he needs our help. Primaries are approaching, and we have the opportunity to vote for leaders who will respect and protect our foundations. Sadly, only one out of three Christians vote in a general election, and it's much, much less than that in a primary election. In fact, one out of three Christians are not registered to vote in any election. The 2012 presidential primaries could be the most important elections in our lifetime. In some states, you must register by party to vote in primary elections, but don't let that dissuade you. If we don't vote in the primaries, then our choice in the general is often between the bad and the worse. Voting in primaries helps good candidates move forward so that they can be there in the general election. Today, you have an opportunity to do something proactive to ensure that our foundations are preserved. Register to vote right now in this place. Then boldly and proudly vote your faith and vote your values in the upcoming primary elections. God bless.
I'm sure you've heard it by now. Vote. Make your voice heard. And at this point, I'm sure you're thinking, why bother? Why take 30 minutes out of your day to stand in line with strangers when at the end of it all, one vote is just a drop in the bucket? It's just one little vote out of millions and millions, and it doesn't really make a difference. Your voice by itself amounts to nothing more than a whisper, right? So maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't, but there's 60 million committed Christians in the United States, and only about 30 million of them vote in any given election. Maybe the other 30 million are thinking what you're thinking. It's just one vote, so why bother? Perhaps one vote doesn't seem like a lot, but 60 million votes are. If 60 million like-minded Christians will cast their votes on election day, all those little drops will fill the bucket, and all those little whispers will add up to a very loud voice that will be heard and make a difference. So don't fool yourself into thinking that your vote doesn't matter, because it does. But what matters even more is who you influence to vote with you. It really comes down to faith and action. If all the Christians in America start joining their voices and their vote together, one by one, multiplied across the nation, we can change the course of our country. So make sure you vote. But first, you have to register. If you're not registered, you can't vote. Register today at www.RestoreAmerica.org. It will take less than two minutes. And then, make sure you vote.